Hi everybody, Richard Ham here. Today we're going to be talking about Yido, or I don't know if that's really how you pronounce it, but we'll just go with Yido, Y-E-D-O, um, a game from a couple of brand new designers. Um, and you know, if I were to sum up this game in one sentence, I think I'd basically go with uh, Lords of Waterdeep on steroids. This is definitely the game for all those people out there who look at Lords of Waterdeep and say, "What? Well, there's nothing to it. It's nothing." I mean, because this basically takes some of those ideas, but you know, turns them on their head and adds a bunch of really just. There is a lot going on in this game. Um, while well, it's still at its heart, a pretty straightforward worker placement game where you're trying to gather resources to complete goals. So um, let's just get right to it so you guys can get an understanding of what the game is like to play. Um, after first saying hi to Tulu over there who's taking a snooze, and yes, those are Jen's feet. But enough of that. Um, don't worry, honey, just your feet. Um, Edo. Okay, so this is the board. And I should say the board is gigantic. I have to go all the way back here. I can't even get back far enough to get the whole thing on screen, I think. Um, but uh, it's a very big, bright, colorful board, and um, let's see. Let's just get right into it. Now, at the beginning of the game, well, here's the rules. Where is it? I've set up the board. Um, so the first thing players do is they get to, each player gets to have four mission cards, um, and that's what these are over here. And, you know, Jen and I can't help ourselves. We call them quests. There are easy, medium, hard, and impossible missions to complete. Um, and each player gets to start with four missions. The game insists that of the four missions you take, one of them has to be either the hard or super hard. So for myself, I'm going to take a hard one, and then I'll take, I don't know, a couple of easy ones, and let's say a medium one. And Jen, let's say she's just going to take three easy ones, one, two, three, and a super hard one. You know, but it's really up to players. I mean, you could take all super hard ones, but that would be not particularly smart. But anyway, so we get our, for, um, our four starting missions that we're going to be uh, going after, and I'll look at these in a second. And then the other thing, let's see, we each get 12 bucks. I already got the 12 bucks out. Oh, yes, we also each get to choose um, action cards. The cards we'll be using up there, which you could kind of think of them, if you're thinking in Lords of Waterdeep terms, you could think of them as intrigue cards. Um, but anyway, before I actually decide what they're going to be, I'm going to take a quick look at the um, quest cards I've got, or the mission cards I've got. Let's see, I've got a kidnapping, uh, espionage, another kidnapping, and two espionage and two kidnappings. And if you look at what um, I'm going to need to complete these, let's just grab, let's just grab this uh, simple one. Really, you know, it's, it's one of the easy ones. Uh, it's espionage. It's learn who's been invited to the uh, Shogun's reception. It's the utmost importance that we know who is currently in favor of the Shogun. Therefore, we ask you get your hands on a list of those who visited his reception last week. And um, to complete this mission, I have to have a worker or disciple, they're called, in um, the uh, palace, which I don't know if you can quite make out that icon. That's a palace icon, which matches the palace icon here on the board. So I have to have, to complete this mission, a worker in the palace. And that's it. This is a really simple one. Um, I have a worker in the palace. I will successfully make five bucks. However, there's a bonus. If I also, at the same time, have a worker here in the red light district, which you can see over here, there's the red light district. If I have a worker in the red light district, at the same time I have one in the palace, I'll actually make another five. So I'll make 10 in total. And one of the things that's really, really cool, all these missions are very, very thematic. So, you know, it's all, you know, I, in theory, I was investigating at the palace. I found out, um, you know, who's invited to the Shogun's reception, but then I followed them to the red light district. And so I got extra, you know, um, money. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, as they get more and more complicated, like here's uh, the level... The, the hard one I found, for this one to complete it, to kidnap Alfredo Fernandez, the black ship's captain, I have to have a uh, disciple in the, the, uh, the waterfront, um, you know, as you imagine, because I got to kidnap a captain from a ship, I got to have a disciple on the waterfront, and one over at the local tavern, because that's probably where I grab him. I grab him at the tavern, and then take him to my ship to get him out of town. I also have to have a geisha to, do, you know, to obviously um, go, bring him in, and then I've got to have some poison food, no doubt to knock him out, and I've got to have um, my own dojo, uh, no doubt to train for the thing. And if I have all of these things, all of these um, you know, elements in place, I will earn three points, ten dollars, or one, or whatever it's called, and, a, um, and a, an action card. And then on top of that, if I have the bonus of, if I also have a worker over at the marketplace, no doubt to get me extra stuff I need, and some rope, no doubt to tie the guy up, I'll get an extra action card and an extra five bucks. So that's the kind of stuff you're thinking about. You're trying to collect all this stuff and have be in the right place at the right time with all your things to complete missions. Um, and with that information in mind, 
I'm going to actually do the other thing before I start. I get to choose, I get to draw three action cards and keep one. So let's look at what I get. One, two, three. And this is just part of setup before the game starts. So um, the three I have to choose from are Thriving on Confusion, Dishonorable Conduct, and Come On Faster. See, so this one is, uh, oh, get to uh, manipulate the patrol. I'll explain that in a bit. This one is uh, play this card right after you've activated your disciple and place him in the class, immediately choose to activate another. Oh, um, this means I could do um, two workers back to back, and so I could, like, you know, jump ahead of my opponents. Dishonorable contact, play this card after an opponent completes a mission. Your opponent only gains half the prestige points um, the initial army yield. Uh, so this is a nasty card to play on um, your opponent. And, you know, I would say about... 20% of that action card deck is um, cards that are all about, you know, taking cards from your other opponent, cutting their points in half, that sort of thing. Um, Jen and I, eh, we're not really crazy about those. And in fact, um, much like uh, Gates of Luoyang, we tend to take the nasty cards out because they're still, you know, 80% of that deck is not nasty or just things to help you. But anyway, I'm not going to use either of those. I'm going to keep this come on faster because that's the one I'm going to choose to help myself out in the future. Now, um, you're sp there's no discard piles. You're supposed to put everything at the bottom of the decks, but with one hand, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to discard stuff over there. But normally, my discarded cards would go back under the deck so nobody knows what I discarded. So I'm starting with these four missions and the ability to come on faster, which lets me control the town guard, which is this little marker over there. Meanwhile, you know, Jen, I'm just gonna draw one for her, but I don't know what she got. I'll worry about that on her turn. And so she's got a card, she's got four missions of her own. And then the last thing we do before we start, uh, thank you for your patience so far, is um, the last player gets first dibs on one of these Shogun bonuses that the uh, Shogun, the leader of the city, will bestow upon us. And so I'm first, that means Jen gets to choose one of these first. She will choose, um, what the heck, she's gonna take a blessing which uh, is this symbol right here. So um, there are two blessings to be had in a two-player game. And so she grabs one of them immediately. Come here, you. And puts it over here on her little player card. And you can see there's only one space. You can only have one blessing at a time. So she can't grab another, but she's grabbed that one. She's got two workers as well. And so, so she chose the blessing, which means she takes this card, flips it over, and this is another card she has throughout the rest of the game, Blackmail, which she can use to, um, it's kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card. If the town guard ever gets in her way, she can use this to blackmail him, um, but if she doesn't ever use this card, she gets two additional points at the end of the game. So now, um, I get to choose, and what do I want? I'm going to choose to, I'm going to use this one. I can have a bonus card, plus three more bucks. So that means I'm not choosing seven bucks. I'm not choosing an action card plus three, because I already got an action card. I'm not choosing, I see, I could start with an extra weapon drawn randomly, plus three cards, or three dollars. I'm not going to do those. Instead, I'm going to do a um, bonus card plus three bucks. So I'm going to start with three more dollars in gen. There's an extra three bucks. And I get to take the top bonus card off the deck. This is basically a goal card that lets me know what I'm trying to do to get bonus points in the game. If you've completed at least one minute mission of each of the five categories at the end of the game, I'll get six points. So now this is something I am trying to do throughout the course of the game. And if you look back at my missions I've got, um, I didn't get the greatest draw for that. I've got a kidnapping, I've got two kidnappings and two espionage. So I want to get, you know, some of the other types of missions as well, um, you know, assassination and all the other things. Um, you know, again, if you liken it to Lords of Waterdeep, where you have those four types of missions, you know, warfare and alchemy, or, you know, I forget what they all are, arcana, you know, th this has kind of the same thing, but in a feudal Japan setting instead of a Dungeon and Dragon setting. But anyway, um, I'm going to want to try over the course of the game to le do at least one mission of each of the five categories to get six bonus points. And now that's a secret that I will keep here in my bonus card section where you'll notice I can have two bonuses that I can keep track of over the course of the game. If I ever get a third, I have to get rid of one. I can also have a maximum hand of three action cards of which I've drawn one, the come on faster. And um, at any given time, you can only have four uncompleted missions and you start with four uncompleted missions. So that's my situation. Jen, she started with a blessing that might help her out and some stuff and I mean I'm, I'll, I'll look at her stuff when it's her turn anyway we're now ready to start playing so everybody has a um, turn order thing on their board and let's just look at it first thing the prep phase of every round of which there are 11 rounds um, the prep phase move the round marker one space forward okay yeah we're on turn number one we're in January if you think of it in as you know the 11 months of a year uh, let's see uh, return the marker to the bank track. Yep, that's already set up. Um, add money to the church, 3-1, and a player with dojo. Now, neither of us have a dojo yet. Um, this is places where we can build buildings. No, neither of us have built a dojo, so we don't get the bonus points. Bye, pups. 
Um, but the church, at the beginning of every turn, gets some money. So I take three bucks and put it on the church right there, which is ripe for stealing. Because I should say, we are nasty individuals, our clans. We are like working clandestinely behind the scenes to influence the city and do all kinds of nefarious bad deeds, which is why we always have to watch out for the city guard who will arrest us on site. Anyway, we are totally set up now. Um, 10 minutes in the video, ready to start playing. First thing, the bidding phase. Um, half of this game is an auction where players take turns bidding. Um, Jen's got 12 bucks, I've got 15 bucks on um, getting additional cards, building buildings, getting additional workers or geishas over there, getting more quests. And in a four or five player game, you can see there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven places to bid on. But in a two or three player game, they're broken down to colors. So you can bid on the reds and then choose what you get, bid on the blacks and choose what you get, or bid on the whites and choose what you get. Now, I am the first player, and so I'm going to place an opening bid. Um, and let's see, what do I want to get? I want to, well, actually, I have to look at my um, quest. What do my quests want? Now, I'm not going to be able to do this hard one for a while. Let's look at one of my easy, uh, I got two easy ones, right? Yeah. Let's see if I can get one of these done pretty quick. Now, this easy one needs a shuriken. And what do you know? There's a shuriken out there for sale. I might buy that this turn. Um, let's see, I need to be in the uh, tavern. Let's uh, see, this one needs to be in the palace. Uh, let's see, I, um, but oh, to the bonus, I need to be in the red light district for this. And for this, I need rope. So this quest, if I want to you know, kidnap the innkeeper's wife, a kidnapping quest, I need to have two weapons if I want to get the main and the bonus points. So I might want to get some extra weapons to start out. My medium difficulty quest, let's see, oh, I need a privilege um, in addition to being over at the temple. This is to learn who will present at the morning ceremony. Um, and then on top of that, I need to build a building if I want to. I need to have this building built, this um, garden in my um, shogun. So I'm going to actually... I want this, guys. I want to start working on this medium level quest. So I want to get this building built. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bid on the black section because if I win black, I can either take a geisha or take one of these buildings. So I will bid five because I have to do the, um, the opening bid of five. It's five for the two blacks. I bid five. It's now Jen's turn. Does she want to raise the bid or is she just going to let me have it for super cheap? Um, she's not going to let me have her super cheap. She's going to raise it. Um, but, you know, she doesn't have much more money than me. She's just going to raise it a little bit just to make it a bit more expensive for me. She's going to raise it to six. All right. And I'll say, all right, that's fine. I'll, I'll go seven. And um, this, is a, this is not a back and forth bid forever. Um, the opening person gets a bid. Everybody else gets to up that bid. And then the opening person gets a final bid to decide if they want to stay in. And so I am staying in. So I'm going to pay seven bucks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Of my starting money, Jen made me pay a little bit more than my opening of five to get a building. And this garden is what I want to build. Because like I said, I need it for one of my quests. And it comes over here um, in this place. It's the Karisansui, or however you pronounce it, um, which gives me a new ability. I can place, in addition to placing workers out on the board, I can also have my own private place I can place my workers. And when I place my workers here, I get foresight, which lets me um, look ahead at what the cards are coming so I can make better decisions. Um, also, um, if I have a worker here, it counts as if I have one blessing. Um, and although none of my quests require blessings, I don't think. Uh, nope. The, the, yeah, none of my quests require blessings. I don't have to worry about the blessing. But um, I do have this building, which means I will be able um, to uh, you know, get the bonus on this espionage quest. So, and now um, we finished my bid. And so I'm out of the bidding now. So it's Jen's turn to bid. And because I can't counter bid, she gets anything she wants at the lowest cost. However, the blacks are not available, so she can't get a building or a geisha. So you can either take a white, any of these stacks, or she can take a black, um, you know, or I'm sorry, a red. And she's going to take a red. She's going to pay her three, which is the minimum she has to bid. And again, I can't raise her. She's going to take three. And she's going to grab an extra worker. So she's starting the game with three workers to my two. Let's see, now where are we? The bidding phase is over and we now move on to the event phase where we um, add three new weapons to the marketplace and reveal the top event card. Let's see, for starters, let's have three new weapons. Um, come here, you, one, a sword, another sword, and some uh, spiky brass knuckles. So that becomes the weapons marketplace. All of these cost eight, and these ones, which are not going to stick around forever, if you don't buy them quick, cost six. We also have to reveal our first event of the game, of which there will be 11. Could be good, it could be bad. Let's see what it is. 
Oh my god, it's an earthquake. Wow. This is actually one of the nastiest cards in the game. How exciting that it should start at the beginning. Um, and actually, I should also point out, you notice it says Samurai up here? The game comes with an easy and a normal difficulty. Samurai is the normal difficulty, but if you want to play the easy difficulty, the Geisha difficulty, you take all these cards out of the deck. However, we're big boys, we can handle it. Let's deal with the earthquake. An earthquake levels part of the city. If possible, each player loses one. Oh my god! Wow! Um, one annex of his own choice and one disciple if the player owns more than two disciples. Each player may choose to return his blessing counter to the temple to avoid either losing an annex or one disciple. <sighs> what a bad opening turn for me. Um, like I said, there's a handful of cards in here that are really super devastating, and this is one of the bad ones. You can see why the rules actually encourage it. It's, it's not a sign of weakness to take these cards out. They're just so nasty. Um, you know, they can be real big game changers, but. I'm going to take it out. My bad luck, I happen to have just built an annex, which means one of these bonus things. My earthquake, the earthquake just destroyed this. There's nothing I can do about it. Because you'll notice how it says, um, if you like, you can give up your blessing to avoid the bad stuff. But remember, Jen took an opening blessing. I took an opening bonus card. So I cannot protect myself with that blessing. So I've lost an annex and one disciple if I own more than two disciples. I only own two disciples, so at least I don't lose anything more. But that annex that I just paid seven bucks for, just lost it. Ouch. Meanwhile, Jen, she has no buildings to lose. Um, no big deal. She uh, does, however, have three workers, so she's going to lose one of these workers. You never have less than two. But remember, if she had more than two, she'd lose one. However, she is going to give up her blessing she got for free at the beginning of the game to protect herself from the earthquake, which means she doesn't lose a worker. Thanks, event. All right. Anyway, moving on. Um, you guys are getting to see uh, the game in all, I mean, the game can be pretty harsh, pretty punishing, almost has kind of like a uh, Year of the Dragon vibe. But again, if you don't like it, take the samurai cards out of the deck, and then this deck, um, you know, the punishing things aren't very punishing, and there's a lot of really positive good things in here too. In fact, I'd say it's more commonly positive things. But anyway, we had an event. It was not good for me. We're moving on to the assigning phase. This is worker placement time. I'm the first player. I get to place the first worker. I'm going to take my, um, one of my two guys, and I'm going to put him. Now, I could have put him in my annex, except, oh, it just got destroyed in the earthquake. So I got to put it out on the big board. Um, and by the way, there's, in a two-player game, there's these little markers to indicate where um, you know, um, zones have been turned off. But anyway, I'm going to put a worker out. And for starters, thinking about my quests, I'm going to put a worker in... Um, what am I gonna, I'm going to put a worker in the, let's see, do I want to complete this Shogun Reception or do I want to complete, oh, I'm going to complete the Kidnap the Innkeeper's Daughter, which means I'm going to want to put a worker, because um, I, I, you know, to complete this I have to have a shuriken and I have to have a worker at the tavern. So I'm going to put a worker over here in the tavern. This is going to be the guy I'm setting up to um, kidnap the innkeeper's daughter. Now it's Jen's turn. And I'm sorry, I have not actually looked at all of what she can do. So let me just take a second to really quickly look at her quests while you guys can look at the pretty box art. Because it is very pretty box art. What's she going to want to do? Um, right, she could do that. Uh, all right, okay. Let's say she does this. All right, so that's what she's going to want to do. Right, that's the quest she cares about. Right, so Jen is going to take her first worker and put it over here in the, um, the Buddha area. Now, there's a couple things that, or actually, I'll, I'll explain what she can do with her workers. I mean, right now, I'm just going to place them. So I've got one more worker to place. And now remember, my quest is I want to kidnap the innkeeper's daughter. I've got the guy in place in the tavern who's going to get the job done. But remember, I also need a shuriken. I don't have a shuriken. Where do I get that? I'm going to go over to the marketplace and buy one. Because remember, there is a shuriken for sale right here in the marketplace. And now Jen, she's got another worker. What is she going to do? She is going to, um, oh, all right. She's going to place a guy over here. Oops, hey, where's the, oh, whoops, the markers got moved. Uh, there's only two places in the uh, waterfront. She's going to place a worker in the waterfront, and now she's got one more worker. So for her last worker, what is she going to do? She is going to um, place a worker over here. No, she's not going to go in the temple. Um, you know, I think she actually will go in the temple. Not because it's necessarily the smartest thing in the world for her to do, but basically to show some basic function. Um, um, anyway, so she's going to come over here into the temple and take this spot, which I'll explain in a second. 
Right, so we've placed all our workers. We have com completed the assigning phase. Now, we go on to the watch patrol phase, where the watch patrol, the city guard, moves one district. Um, we influence his movement, we influence his capture, and then um, he arrests guys. Now, what that means is, this little blue guy, over the course of the game, every turn is going to move, as you can see, in a uh, counterclockwise fashion. He started here at the gates, so this turn, he um, automatically, at this point, moves to the um, um, the temple, or not the temple, the the Shogun's Palace area, where it just so happens Jen has a worker. Now, um, that means there's a danger her worker is going to get arrested. Because remember, we're bad guys. We're clandestine people working in the shadows. So Jen could get her guy arrested, which means he would not do what he sent her here for. But however, we now have the opportunity to um, do two things. Influence his movement and influence his capture. Now you recall, I have an action card, come on faster. I can make him to move two extra districts in the appropriate direction. So if I was worried about him, I could force him to move two more spaces. Um, but obviously I don't care because I'm not in this region. But it, um, this is a way I can get out jail free card. I can just shoo him along and then do whatever I needed. Jen has a starting card as well. Stealth. Which means um, one of your disciples that would be arrested um, in this phase escapes arrest and remains on the space. So Jen has used this card, her stealthy card, to ensure that the town guard doesn't find her. So she'll continue to be able to do her work. Um, and that was her influencing capture. She avoided capture. And now nobody gets arrested. And now finally, we move on. Oh, actually, this is interesting. We move on to the trade phase. In the case that um, multiple players are in the tavern or at the marketplace, you can do Settlers of Catan style trading. If both Jen and I were up here in the market, we could actually trade with each other weapons for money. We're not, so we're not going to do that. If we were both down here, we could trade a lot of stuff. We could trade geishas, we could trade money, we could trade weapons, we could trade cards, you could trade just a... I think the only thing you can't trade is completed quests. So we could actually trade anything we wanted. Quests, the whole nine yards. Um, now I, I think that really comes into play a lot more with more players because there's a lot of wheeling and dealing and um, you know so if you imagine that kind of Catan stuff put into a work player's game really really excellent but to make it happen multiple players have to be in the trading area however um, both Jen and I aren't here so we couldn't trade in if we want to so now we go to the end of the turn the last phase the action phase in player order one disciple at a time gets active now I'm the first player um, as evidenced by the little markers up there so I'm gonna go first I can activate this guy or this guy. Now remember, my quest required that I have some shuriken, so before I actually do the quest of kidnapping the uh, innkeeper's wife, I am going to buy a shuriken. So I take this guy off to indicate I've activated him, and I can buy this shuriken for six bucks. So, um, let's see, five, which gives me two bucks change. I bought a shuriken. And now I have this shuriken for the rest of the game. This is not a disposable item. I can use this over and over and over again. So that was my turn. Now it's Jen's turn. She takes one of her workers off the board. She is going to take this guy back. Now there's two things she could do with um, that guy. That guy could grab another one of these blessings, which is what she's going to do. She might need it for a quest. She might just want to protect herself, but she's going to grab that. But alternatively, that guy could have um, allowed her to look at the top three of any of the uh, quest decks so that she could actually make a smart predictive planning for what kind of quest she's going to grab in the future. Or alternately, she could look at the top three um, event cards so she could know if good things or bad things are coming and then time stuff accordingly. However, she just chose to grab um, another blessing, maybe because one of her quests needs it, maybe because she just wants protection. Um, oh, I should have said the other thing I could have done, instead of buying the shuriken, I could have actually sold back a, a uh, goal card or an action card for two bucks. Say this goal I've got, I, late in the game, I'm saying, I'm never going to finish this. I could sell it for money, which is a brilliant little mechanic. Very, very nice. Sometimes you need the money more than the bonus that you'll never be able to pay off. So anyway, my turn. Oh, I'm, I'm, yes. So now my other guy. Now this guy in the tavern can do a couple of things. He could let me look through the top three weapons that are going to come up and rearrange that so I could control, um, you know, have more control over what weapons are coming out. Um, or I could pay 11 bucks to build a building, which remember up here the default bid was five, which I you know I built one for seven. Under normal circumstances, if you if you lose those auctions, you can still get done what you need to get done. Oops, sorry, that's supposed to be there. You can still get done because you always pay the full price of 11 for a building. But this guy is not here to do either of those things. When you have a worker, you can either do what's on the board or he can complete a quest for you. This guy is completing kidnap the innkeeper's wife quest. So I'm pulling him off. So now I pull out my quest card. I showed everybody at the table that yes, my guy was at the tavern, and yes, I had some shuriken, which means I score one victory point and I make six bucks.
boink. And let's see, two bucks. So I just made six bucks. Now I paid six bucks to buy that shuriken, of course. So you might think I break even. But again, in a big surprise, unlike most games, I don't use up this shuriken. This is my shuriken. I can use this over and over and over for lots of missions. So basically, this is mission just paid for my long-term invested in shurikens. And let's see, do I have any other quests that need shuriken? I don't, but you know, when I'm picking up other quests, that's something I want to bear in mind, that I've got shuriken. Anyway, so I got, um, I completed this quest, it goes under here, and I have now completed a kidnap quest. Remember my bonus is I want to do one of each. Maybe I don't even want to bother with this other kidnapping quest um, because I really want to start doing espionage and other things. So that was mine. Now Jen's still got two more workers. She's going to pull this worker off the board out of the uh, palace. And um, this worker was on this space, which means she now can rearrange player order. And that's exactly what she's going to do. She's going to fix it so she is first from now on. Good for her. Um, and then I could go, but I don't have any more workers. So her last worker, she's going to pull out of the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the chipyard, where she can either um, take a sneak peek um, at the future of what's coming for um, bonus cards. She can trade money for victory points, buying um, you know, spices from uh, foreign traders. Or she can, this is cute, steal from the church, which is what she's going to do. She's just um, going to take this three bucks that showed up and steal from the church. So she's starting next turn with a lot more money than me. I'm starting next, well, I'm starting next turn with eight bucks. She's um, starting next turn with 12 bucks. So she will do much, much better in the auctions than I will next turn. And that was the end of the year. We now move on to um, month number two, we move on to the month of February, where we're going to start the whole thing over. Um, you know, uh, you know, new stuff, new weapons are going to come out. Um, old weapons didn't get bought are going to get discarded. New ones come out. Uh, we're going to do more bidding to get more quests, to put more workers out, etc., etc. That is the first of 11 rounds that we will play over the course of this game. Very, very simple, very, very quick to play, very um, straightforward. And now I'm actually going to continue to play a couple more months. So you can start seeing some of the more interesting parameters of, you know, or permutations of the gameplay. Um, but you've, you've, got, you've seen like the basics that, um, uh, you know, you, you deal with on a turn to turn basis. Now, at this point, you'll notice there's some buttons that either let you um, continue watching me play to see a few more rounds and start seeing some more combinations, you know, start watching me pick up some more quests, um, you know, do some more intrigues, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can push the other button, which lets you skip directly to my final thoughts. And I'll let you choose right now um, after a five second countdown. Five, four, three, two, um, choose one, choose it now. One and a half, one and a quarter, one. Okay, bye-bye, talk to you later.